We're with John Grunsfeld, who is the Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate at NASA, also a former astronaut. Um, so John, uh, what, what's your excitement level with this mission uh, on the eve of launch uh, tomorrow morning? Well, I'm excited at any rocket launch. I grew up launching model rockets as a kid, uh, a lot of model rockets, and I think that's one of the things that inspired me. So this is not a model rocket, but a real rocket, a Delta IV Heavy. This is a big rocket, and on top, of course, we have the Orion test article. Uh, I think it was Robert Heinlein who said, you know, all journeys start in low Earth orbit, and we're not only going to go through low Earth orbit, we're going to blow the low Earth orbit away with the Orion capsule, do a really high uh, trajectory, and then come slamming back into the Earth's atmosphere to validate Orion's performance. Orion is that first step uh, in our journey of exploration that I sincerely hope will take us to Mars in the not too distant future. And before you go to Mars, one of the things uh, you hope to do with the Orion spacecraft is to uh, go to an asteroid that's brought back uh, near the moon. Uh, can you talk about the science opportunities that an asteroid retrieval mission offers that you couldn't do with an unmanned mission like, uh, like Hayabusa 2, which just launched uh, yesterday? Well, I think the first thing is that we're on Mars now. Mars exploration is not a new journey for humans. Uh, so far, we've just been able to put out robotic spacecraft. And so the same analog is true for our asteroid exploration. We are actually exploring asteroids today. The Dawn mission is, has left Vesta. It's on its way to Ceres, the largest asteroid uh, in the belt, but we're not going to sample it. But in 2016, we launched the OSIRIS-REx mission. This is a very daring mission that's going to go out to Bennu. It's about a 500-meter asteroid, and it actually is one that crosses the Earth's orbit, which means it's a potentially hazardous asteroid. It's a carbonaceous object, meaning you know, it's primitive carbon material from the origin of the solar system. And we're going to orbit it, study it in great, great detail, learn about what minerals, about what, it, what kind of carbon compounds are on there. And then we're going to go and do a touch and go, a landing on the surface, grab a sample and bring it back to Earth. So that's really our first asteroid sample return mission. Uh, we've proposed the asteroid retrieval mission where a solar electric mission will go out to a, a, an asteroid, bring back you know, a large sample, either the whole asteroid or a piece of an asteroid, a boulder, uh, and then that will be in, put into lunar retrograde orbit, uh, and the option we're exploring is for an Orion spacecraft launched on a space launch system, the most powerful rocket we've ever built uh, in the 2020s, uh, to go and rendezvous with that spacecraft, dock to it, and then allow astronauts to go and practice EVA. And, and, and uh, can you talk a little bit about the science opportunities that offers to send people to an asteroid? What, how much more research could you get out of a mission like that than an unmanned mission? Well, all exploration is human exploration. OSIRIS-REx is human exploration. There'll be scientists on the ground using their cameras to decide where to go to do this grab of rocks. But in the end, even though we'll pick an area on the surface, It'll be much like the Philae lander with ESA. They picked a landing spot based on the best, best available science, but in the end, you know, just the nature of the surface, they bounced off and they ended up in a different place. Uh, with humans on scene, you know, we're much more adaptable. We think in real time, we're able to make those decisions. And so, you know, if we're exploring, you know, a rock in space, you know, we'll be able to decide that's the sample, talk to folks on the ground and say, yes, that's the piece we want to bring back. So there's an opportunity uh, to bring back more samples, but contextually uh, more important samples, more valuable samples. And I know there's been some discussion about launching uh, robotic missions on the space launch system as well, some science missions. What are the advantages of using the SLS for a, a mission to the outer solar system or a large telescope, uh, for example? What, what sort of opportunities does SLS offer for those missions? Well, of course, any time you know, we look at a large heavy lift rocket, the opportunities are, you know, are really exciting for, for instance, for going out to the outer solar system. Uh, one of the missions we are talking about is a mission to Europa. If we use an existing expendable launch vehicle, the transit times by doing a flyby Venus, multiple Earth flybys, and a slingshot out to the outer solar system results in almost an eight-year trajectory. Uh, Pluto New Horizons, July 2015, is going to arrive at Pluto. It will have taken a decade of crews because we, we really don't have the kind of rocket that can send it directly out there. We have to do this slingshot maneuver. A large rocket like the Space Launch System, we could leave Florida and go directly to Europa two and a half, three years. 
So that's transformational. Plus, uh, we have to work really hard to make these spacecraft extraordinarily delicate, I mean, extraordinarily rugged, even though they have delicate instruments, to survive the launch loads. If we have a really big rocket, we could put a soft ride on, acoustic dampening, various ways to protect the important payload uh, that we otherwise wouldn't be able to lift. Of course, a heavy lift might have a large fairing, which in the space launch system will. That would allow us to put a much larger telescope into the uh, fairing and launch it that might be able to deploy uh, in deep space and allow us to find out you know, what are we alone in the universe. Look at the atmosphere of a planet around a nearby star that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do if we didn't have a big telescope. So those are a couple of the examples. Of course, the, the best example is that we could send a mission to Mars uh, as a scientific mission that, for instance, could have all of the components to orbit Mars, enter, land, go back up from the surface, an ascent vehicle, and then return to Earth for Mars sample return. Those are the kind of things that it could enable. Of course, you know, those are far future plans. And uh, the SLS is obviously a much more capable launch vehicle than anything else available today but it's also going to cost more. What are, what are your hopes for, you know, get, what, what are the budget prospects for paying for a launch on SLS, even with these big benefits that you just mentioned? Well, of course, my framework is the space shuttle. And, and also the Apollo program. The Saturn V was really a science mission. Apollo 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, uh, these were, and 17, were science missions with ever-increasing capability. That's what the astronauts did on the surface. So even though it was a human spaceflight vehicle, its purpose was to do science on the moon. The space launch system I see in the same framework. The space shuttle uh, was a space transportation system, but it enabled enormous amounts of science. Science we're doing on the space station today, but also one that's very close and uh, near and dear to my heart is the Hubble Space Telescope. Because these were NASA science missions, not science mission directed, not human mission directed, NASA science missions, uh, the cost sharing was extremely beneficial for science. The, you know, one part of the agency was funding the transportation, the other the science. I'm hoping that we can work out some kind of a hybrid like that with the space launch system so that you know, from the science budget specifically, we don't pay the full carrying cost because the agency is going to build the space launch system regardless if we pay some kind of marginal cost. Thank you very much, John. My pleasure. Nice talking to you. Thank you.